Hi everyone, I'm BJ. I'm the genealogy specialist at the State Library here in Maine. And tonight I'm really happy to be here talking Okay, you got me on the mute. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> it happens. So I'm really happy to be here doing this talk for what was my childhood library. And so um, I'm gonna talk about just what does Scots-Irish mean and some about how it's more about what records are available rather than actual techniques for searching. Um, and I have other videos at YouTube under genealogy at the Maine State Library um, that are more about the details of how to do genealogy. So any hit wave, let's start by me sharing my screen. <laughs> and there we go. So I start with this question that seems silly until we get into this, and that is, what is Ireland? Well, right now it can refer to either the entire island or more usually it refers to the Republic of Ireland, which in this right-hand map is the darker brownish beige, whatever you wanna call that. And then this part of the island is part of the United Kingdom, with England, Scotland, and Wales. And originally, the island of Ireland had four provinces. And the northernmost one was Ulster. And then you had the other three further south. Now, what happened with Ulster, and we'll get into this in a minute, um, is it was divided in 1922. And six of the counties became what's now called Northern Ireland, the part of the UK, and the other three counties in what was traditionally Ulster became part of the Republic of Ireland. And this will become obvious why I wanted to talk about this, because what happens with the records when you're doing research in Ireland is some of them are going to be up here in Belfast, and some are going to be down here in Dublin. And it so one of the tricks of doing any genealogy in Ireland is figuring out where the records are going to be. Now, below provinces, you have counties, which are still used. Baronies aren't used that often. You had parishes that were both civil and religious. Basically, a civil parish is what we think of as a town. And the religious parishes would be either the Catholic or the Church of Ireland, which is the Anglican Church, the Episcopalian Church in the US. And then that's the lowest level that would have real government. But then within a civil parish, you would have a bunch of what are called townlands, which are from a couple farms up to a couple dozen. Um, think about them as kind of like little villages or crossroads within a, um, a town. There's no real government, but people know what they are. And to a great extent, when you do searching, you're going to be aiming for finding the town land your ancestor was from. But I wanted to show you this because often people get garbled family traditions about where somebody was. And you might have a parish for one couple greats grandparent and the town a townland name for another couple greats grandparent. And so you need to be aware that there are those types of things. So anyhow, for most of the last several hundred years, most of all of Ireland was under English control. And that has a decided impact on the records. So for one thing, the Church of Ireland until the 1870s was the established church of Ireland which means that it was official. It was supported by taxes and its records were considered government records. And that's gonna come in to play in a little, a few minutes. Um, to a great extent, through much of the time that England was in control of Ireland, 
the Catholic Church was discriminated, the Catholics were discriminated against. So were Protestants who were not members of the Church of Ireland. Again, that's going to come into play in a minute or two. So late 1800s, early 1900s, you end up with the beginnings of an Irish independence movement. Um, there's an uprising at Easter in 1916 that's very violent. Um, if any of you have seen the movie Michael Collins, you'll know about this. Um, there's a war of independence and right after World War I. And then once the Irish Free State is um, established, which is everything except these six pink counties, it's the whole rest of Ireland, the other 26 counties. There's then a civil war between two different portions of the independence movement. And this is important because in 1922, um, state records were stored in Dublin in an area called the Four Courts. And in June of that year, the IRA barricaded themselves in the Four Courts Public Record Office and things blew up literally, which means that a whole lot of records, wills, any pre-1901 census returns that had not been pulped for World War I, um, a bunch of other things were gone. So that tends to be a real um, sticking point when you're searching in Ireland because a lot of the Church of Ireland records were destroyed along with the 19th century census, which is a real blow. I know I have several dead ends in my family tree that I probably could have solved if those censuses hadn't been blown up or pulped for World War I. So, Anyhow, let's go on. So why is Northern Ireland separate from Ireland? Well, here's what happened. Back when King James the Sixth of Scotland became King James the First of England, there were several things going on. There was, there was the beginnings of an Irish rebel, independence rebellion in Ireland. And James wanted to reward his followers with land, because at this point, land equals money. And the border between Scotland and England had been rather less than peaceful for several hundred years at this point. And so James had this brilliant idea that what he would do is give some of his followers from Southern Scotland land in Northern Ireland and it would do multiple things. It would take some of the people out of this area of Southern Scotland who are harassing and otherwise making life difficult along this border. It will, would reward his followers and it would make this area of Ireland Protestant, which it, this was still a very big issue at this point. And he wanted to make, you know, he was very anti-Catholic. So this seemed like a win-win for him. Actually a win-win-win. And so that's what he did. And that's why you'll see, oops, went too far. Um, this is actually the same book this is the copy that's right here on my desk, Researching Scots Irish Ancestors. And this is the same book released for the Irish market where it says Ulster Ancestors. And so when you start researching, you may see Scots Irish, you may see Ulster or Ulster Irish as a way of talking about these, the people from Ireland who are descended from these people who 
immigrated from Scotland, mostly in the 1600s. So as you see, there's the difference. So again, you have some that was a little earlier, as you can see down here, they weren't very successful, but this area was, and here you have two different eras under James the first, the lighter red and the darker red. And you also had some areas where private landowners brought settlers over from Scotland to settle. And again, all of this is done to reward people. It's in some cases better farmland than in Scotland. And it's doing what we've seen as a good thing of displacing the Catholic population and making it Protestant. So that's the origin of this whole issue. I expect most of you are old enough that you remember in the 1970s how often the lead international story was the troubles in Northern Ireland. This is the origin of that. It's going back to settling these Protestants in Ireland in order to suppress the, the, the Catholic population. So let me get caught up here on my pages now that I've moved the cat off my... Um, so again, you have this, some in, in around 1600, some a little later, you get some in the 1650s where it's people moving into these areas that already have the, the, the what are becoming known as the Scots-Irish planters. Um, after Cromwell defeats another, yet another Irish rebellion, again, encouraged people from Protestant areas of Scotland to move to um, what's now Northern Ireland to be anti-Irish. The other thing to notice is almost all of the settlers coming from Scotland are from the lowlands and some from the central belt between Glasgow and Edinburgh. So if anybody tells you that your Scots-Irish ancestor was a member of a clan, that's not true. That's a Highland Gaelic con concept, not a Southern Scotland concept. Um, so just, just so you know that. And then there was one last push right around the end of the 1600s up to about 1705 after, um, if you remember when William and Mary took over the English crown um, and settled finally that it was going to be a Protestant country. So mo almost all of this settlement happens between 1605 and 1705. And some of them will have, by this point, you also get people who are beginning to immigrate to what's now North America because there were opportunities that there weren't. Ireland, Northern Ireland is a small country. If you've got six or seven sons, the farm's not gonna support all of them. And it's definitely not going to support all of your grandsons. And so there was a need for land Hi. couldn't expand anymore here they expanded into how north are you? how are you Hi. how are you and so that's where we are with this so let's take a little more of a look at just what's going on in northern ireland to get into the point where you end up with the Scottish prisoners, you end up with the troubles, you end up with difficulty tracing your family history. So here we have, this is a slightly more detailed look at the planters. And you can see how you get the privately settled Scots here on, on the East Coast. You get the English, which would have been Church of Ireland. And that's how you get the established church. And then you get a mix down here, and then this area is Scots again. They don't settle right on in the western half of Donegal. It's really the eastern half. The western half stays Gaelic-speaking Irish Catholic. Um, 
And so by the end of this process of the settling, this area is 43% Protestant, whereas most of the rest of Ireland is still 90% or more Catholic. So what's interesting is you get a series of laws passed by the English run government that basically make it very difficult to be Catholic. Um, and a, a few of these actually apply to Presbyterians as well. Presbyterians and Catholics are excluded from holding public office. Catholic marriages aren't recognized as official. Presbyterian ministry, um, marriages were not actually legally recognized by the Irish government until 1782, which means that in many cases, there are either not any records of the marriage kept or it's in the Church of Ireland records because that was the official state church and it was the closest you could get to what we would now consider going into the town office and getting a marriage license. Um, Catholics and non-Church of Ireland Protestants could not go to most of the universities in Ireland. Um, and then for, further for Catholics, they couldn't vote until 1793, could, couldn't be part of, couldn't become lawyers. There's a ban on foreign education, which doesn't sound that dramatic, but you have to realize that most Catholic priests at this point would have spent some time in France or Italy or Spain learning to be priests. And certainly anyone who was going to move up into becoming a bishop would have done that. And so there was a, this was done as a way to um, basically take away the leadership of the Catholic church because if somebody had gone away for education or had been educated abroad, they couldn't then practice in Ireland. Um, You had Catholics were barred from owning firearms, um, couldn't serve in parliament. One of the other really difficult things was if someone was Catholic and actually owned land, which very few of them did, it had to be equally subdivided among all the sons. So you know, if you're only farming 37 acres and you have five sons, to divide it equally. And this was done to prevent any Catholics from getting a big estate. Um, they could not lease land or buy land for a lease of more than 31 years. Again, trying to you know, um, not allow Catholics to have generational wealth. Um, the other interesting thing with all of this is if a Catholic man died with property and his oldest son converted to being Protestant, he got the whole estate that was no longer divided among all the sons. So as you can see, this was a real attempt to not let Irish Catholics get generational wealth, um, couldn't own a horse valued at over five pounds. Basically that was again, anti-military. They didn't want Catholic, Irish Catholics to own horses of military quality could only build new Catholic churches from wood, not stone, which in Ireland's wet climate means they don't last long. Um, so this is, this is the situation you've got here in the 1600s, 1700s. You have all of these laws passed. Some of them apply to um, Presbyterians as well as Catholics. There's also no intermarriage. You know, if, if you're Catholic and you marry someone who's Protestant, it the, the local government did not take kindly to that. Um, so you can see why Irish Catholics kept rebelling at this point. They were basically being shut out of their own country. And some of this continues through today. Um, there are some things that are interesting in terms of, for example, there's a city up here called Derry, and it's the, the county of Derry. 
And when the planters came in, they renamed it London Dairy. That was over 400 years ago, early 1600s. Well, this is still happening. You'll see people, road signs crossed out. People will, cross, will literally paint out the London and London Dairy. And what's interesting is this sign is actually in the Republic of Ireland, and it still calls that city Derry. Whereas these two, and you, you can tell this, they look alike, but the N tells you it's in Ireland and the A tells you it's in Northern Ireland or the UK. Um, but this, these are within the last couple of years, these pictures. And so, how do other places deal with it? Well, I can tell you that if you catch a bus from Letterkenny, the um, county seat of Donegal, to the city in question here, the bus on the front literally says Derry slash London Derry. So they don't offend anybody or equally offend everybody. And this is how the tourist brochures do it. Look at this. <laughs> Yeah, things to do in Derry, London, Derry. Um, you still get some people who, you know, this is going back to Free Derry being the. the oh, uh, take a look and see how he's doing. Um, free from English control. So, yeah, you know, this still goes on. Um, so, this is interesting. Again, looking at. Presbyterian congregations. And these dark dots were the first ones started fairly soon after the first planters. And then you can see people starting to move away from the coasts. And we see this same settlement pattern here in New England as well. You know, you start along the Atlantic Ocean, you head up the rivers, and then you branch out. This is pretty typical human thing. Um, so, but it just shows you, again, that this is the area that is now Northern Ireland. This is still the Republic of Ireland here. Um, this is in, as of 1766, and you can see how you get very heavily Protestant in this area. And then as you get to the edge, you get less and less until you get down here. That's almost to the border with, with the Republic of Ireland and you're down to less than 10% Protestant. But you can see how given the history, this is a bit of a power pit that we see into our lifetimes. Um, you are, this is again showing that you still have a distinctly Protestant area here. It's less dramatic than it was 150 years ago, but some of this is you've gotten migration away um, that's done a lot of this. Um, here it's looking, this is another one, again, it's just within the counties, you can see how you get, and you know, the city of Derry is up here, so you can see, or Derry, London Derry, um, and so you can see how you get these areas that are just by the ward within where you get real differences there, you know, and it's people have sorted themselves out that way. And again, you get Presbyterian versus Anglican to some extent, which is less of a difference, but it's still telling you, you know, that you're getting English settlement down this way and Scottish there. And this, just one final one here, you've got, this is by uh, people defining themselves by religion. And this is whether they consider themselves British, Irish, or Northern Irish. And you can see there's a pretty, you know, the pretty high correlation between people saying they're Protestant and that they consider themselves part of the UK. And Catholic thinking that they're Irish. 
And there is a dialect of English or, or a separate language, it's debated, called Ulster Scot, which is essentially Scots, so, which is a, a lowland version of English that has actually probably a separate language that then developed in this area um, that is somewhat different than English spoken in Ireland with an Ulster accent. Um, and this is looking in the 1920s at the time of the division where this um, is actually looked this was done in the 1960s. And it's looked at, they, they chose three indexes of looking at someone as Scottish. And you've got Scottish surnames, whether they're Presbyterian and if they speak the Ulster Scots dialect. And as you can see, this brownish color is where people majority wise said they had all three of these. The pinkish, they had two of these three. And then the dotted is where they had one of them. And so again, you can see how you have this heavily Scottish, Scots-Irish, Ulster-Irish, whatever you want to call it here. And as you get further south, you get less identity that way. Does this make sense to everybody? What's going on? Yes. Okay. I know it's a lot of kind of um, socioeconomic stuff, but I wanted you guys to see this um, because it really puts the conflict in, um, in perspective. And then this is looking at, you've got, um, Scottish and English surnames and their prevalence compared to native Irish surnames. And I'm gonna come back to that near the end when I talk about why DNA. So just hold that thought in one, on one side. So anyway, what, oh, and one final one here. This is where poets who worked in, who wrote in Ulster Scots were based. And again, you see exactly the same Oops, my cat is having fun back here. Um, you see exactly the same sort of you know, boomerang shape of where people who identify as Scots-Irish are. So one moment while I move the cat, okay. Those of you who've been to my talks before are used to that pause. So when did people who identify as Scots-Irish come to the US or to North America? Because this really includes Canada as well. You had a bunch coming in who, who migrated in the mid 1600s and they were usually the children and grandchildren of those original early 1600s planters. They tended to settle on the frontier meaning up in the hills of North Carolina and Virginia, Pennsylvania. Uh, and they really saw themselves as frontier settlers. They were leaving religious and political turmoil in England and Ireland. And they were also looking for economic opportunity. In the 1700s, you get generally third to fifth generation Scots-Irish. They're immigrating mostly to places like Pennsylvania and Maryland, with some to New York City, Boston. They're tending to be skilled craftsmen in many cases and coming both to escape the anti-Presbyterian laws and for economic opportunity. Often they were third, fourth, fifth sons if the family was farming but you get a lot of settlement in places like Philadelphia, Baltimore, and along the, the Carolina coast. Um, and then finally, you get people who immigrated in the early to mid 1800s. And there are two things going on here. One is you get what's the equivalent of the Scottish Highland clearances where 
landowners are discovering that sheep are more profitable than renting to small subsistence farmers. And they'll just have more cash in hand from raising sheep and selling the wool and meat than they will from getting a few shillings in rent a year from farmers who are barely making it. Then the other thing that happens is what's called Angorta Moor, which is the great hunger or the potato famine. And there was great leaving of Ireland at this point. Between 1846 and 1851, a quarter of Ireland's population either died or emigrated. They went from about eight and a half million to just over six million people in five years. And a lot of that was deaths. The really poor people went to the cities on the west coast of England and Scotland. Liverpool, Manchester, Glasgow. Um, you got some getting a little further into Edinburgh and Leeds. Um, did not tend, some made it as far as London, but didn't tend to. They tended to stay in the industrial north of England or into Scotland. Um, and it was not just Irish Catholics, it was also Ulster Scots who moved. Um, some landlords assisted their tenants with leaving because then the land was cleared and they didn't have to worry about people dying on it, dying on them. They didn't have to pay higher poor rates in order to support them. Because as you can imagine, when the entire potato crop failed, the demand on what passed for social services at this point was huge. Um, so that's where we are at this point. So how did we get to, Actually, next I'm going to talk about, it. so if you have family who immigrated in these pre-1800, I'm going to talk about eight, after 1800 separately. What do you look for if you're looking for pre-1800 research? There are some records available. Um, they're hard to find sometimes, um, but there are some. There are no existing passenger lists coming to North America before 1820. Even the Mayflower passenger list was, is, is compiled from later sources. So, um, but some of these have been compiled from newspaper accounts, accounts from landlords who did subsidize people moving, people in North America who subsidized people moving here for labor. And some of those are at Ancestry. Others have been published. Some people have um, gone through newspapers because newspaper, and, and I have a handout I'm gonna put in the chat in a bit that has all of this. Um, the Belfast newsletter, which was a newspaper, had the this 18th century comings and goings have been extracted and are at this University of Louisiana website. Some, Anglican Church of Ireland registers survived the um, 1922 Four Courts explosion. Part, some of them survived, some of them had not been sent. This is a case where if the, the priest had not sent them when they were supposed to in the 1870s, it's actually a good thing that they didn't follow the rules. Um, and you will find non-Church of Ireland, but Protestant records in some of these. Um, there are a lot of the Presbyterian church records that exist are either with the Presbyterian Historical Society in Belfast or they are in county level archives in Ireland or Northern Ireland. There are also some early, what are called census substitutes. These only list the um, head of the household and as you can see, it, it, well, it's actually not clear, but the first two of these, the muster rolls and the hearth money rolls are actually um, looking at military. You know, muster rolls were how many men were available, 
hearth money rolls were, were taxing how many hearths or fireplaces a person had in order to raise money for the military. In 1740, they parts of Ireland did a basically a census of the heads of households of the, who was Protestant. Same thing in 1766. And then in 1796, there was um, financial assistance for those growing flax to make linen. And so there was um, a list of those. And the other thing that you cannot find online for the most part, but that if you get back to 1800 and you're looking for your ancestor and you go to Ireland, the great estates owned by the huge landowners, because almost everybody in Ireland rented, you know, fewer than 3% of people owned their land. And in many cases, you had noblemen, gentry, professional men who owned thousands of acres. And so the these estates, you know, one, one of the things I say frequently to those of you who've been in my programs is that money generates records. And so landed estates generate records because they're, you know, who's renting, who's being kicked out because they can't pay, um, who's been paid to repair the roof, who's been paid for, you know, a new horse, all of that. And so those records are some of the best records around. They unfortunately for the most part are not digitized um, many of them are not indexed beyond a folder or a box, and they're not item level indexing. Um, I've dealt with some of these for Scotland, and it's, it's a slog, but you can find great information about your ancestors. I found one where um, one of my, actually it was one of my Scots-Irish ancestors who moved to Scotland. They couldn't afford after the famine to make it to the U.S., um, was renting and there was a, um, the farm stewards accounts included paying the midwife for certain um, renters babies. And one of my ancestors is listed in that. And it's the only clue I have to this ancestor's birth date. So yeah, you can find things like that. So now let's talk about the great hunger. Um, this is what sent many of our ancestors out of Ireland. Um, a couple interesting things here. It was a several year um, blight on the potato. It was not a one year event. Things were already not good before the potato famine happened. You had various other upheavals. And one of the things that had happened was that in the early eight, late 1830s, early 1840s, all parts of the UK, England, Scotland, and Ireland had changed how they did poor relief for various reasons. And so the new system was not able to handle problems from the blight. Um, and it was a complete failure. It wasn't that some places failed and some didn't. The entire island pretty much had potato famine. It was not the only place in Europe that had a famine. I will tell you. Um, it actually, um, I'll show you in a minute a, a slide where it's actually most of Europe. But what had happened in Ireland is that people were so poor that they ate potatoes as a much larger percentage of their diet than in many other parts of Europe. And so having it fail was a problem. Um, so anyway, let's, let's take a look here. This is interesting. One of the things that had happened um, from 1732 to 1841, so approximately 100 years, um, huge chunks of Ireland had, had increases up 
to six times what they had been over the hundred years. And so as you can see, these areas of Ireland, you know, this area up here, you're looking at, they've gone in a hundred years to three to six times what their population had been. So that's already going to put a strain on subsistence farming. Um, and people were poor. Um, in the 1841 census, the census takers evaluated housing as well as enumerating, it, enumerating everybody. And the, unfortunately, the 1841 census itself doesn't survive for the people's names, but the statistics do. And so there were four classes of housing. And you know, first class is you know, the castles and the grand country manors. Most people of moderate means lived in second class housing. Third class was sort of working class. You know, and then there was fourth class housing. And look how on the western side of Ireland, you're getting over half the people in these areas are living in what are essentially sod huts or not much better than that. Um, little drainage, you know, often the animals are sharing the house. There's not a separate barn. And so these two things are combining to mean that once the potato blight comes, and as you can see, it actually started on the continent here um, in June, and then it travels out and actually Oops, you can't really see. It, Ireland is over here and it's, it's at the end of the, this growing season. And so in addition to everything going, it's late enough in the year, they don't have time to plant anything else because it's failing in August. And for those of you who live here in Maine, picture going out tomorrow and if you've got a garden, your entire crop is gone you don't have time to plant anything else, even if you have the money to get new seeds to get you through the winter. So what happens is you get this area in the first three years of the famine, you're getting an extra 50 to 100, over 55% extra deaths. Um, and what happens is I didn't, I couldn't find a good map for this. The potato famine hits early in Northern Ireland. And then later from 1847 to 1849, the deaths um, build up down here. And so it, it sort of goes North to South on the deaths. Um, and I think some of it has to do with the shorter growing season but the other thing that's interesting and which I did not know until I was an adult, is it's not what we're taught in school. During this time, England or Ireland is actually a net exporter of food. There are places in Ireland where they are still growing food for the English and continental European market. And English military the English military is protecting those crops and the ports for them to leave. So this, you know, this is another layer on why did the 20th century troubles happen? Because you get this you know, sort of historical memory of great grandparents dying from the famine while the port five miles away is shipping food to England or to France. So, so compared to the population increase from the early 1700s to 1841, you get an incredible decrease from 1841 to 1851. There are places that in 10 years lost over 30% of their population. Some to emigration, some to um, to death. Um, as you can see, the only places that gained the Belfast, Dublin, and Cork. These are the cities that were beginning to be centers of manufacturing 
And so people were going from these areas into the cities to try to find work. And at this point, the, the pr provisions for taking care of the poor are completely overwhelmed. Poor houses are having horrendous death rates. They can't take everybody in, they're full. They're not desirable places to be. Um, if any of you have seen Oliver, um, English poor houses were actually nicer than um, Irish poor houses. And that seems hard to believe, but it's pretty much true. So that's, that's what the potato famine is. And the other interesting part of this is up until this point, if you had what we would now call Ulster Scots or Scots Irish ancestors who immigrated to the US, up until this point, they would have said they were Irish. And it's only with this influx of the Irish Catholic immigrants that the Scots Irish who had immigrated 100 to 150 years earlier start calling themselves the Scots Irish to distinguish themselves. So um, that's about how life you know, goes even now is you get those distinctions made. But this is what, if, if you have 19th century Irish ancestors who immigrated to the US and Canada, this is why generally. So let's take a look, quick look at 19th century research. And I'm gonna go somewhat quickly through this. Um, because a lot of this is post Scots Irish, but it's it'll show you some about what records are available for those of you who had 19th century or 20th century immigrants. Um, so you get several groups of, of church records. It, the Church of Ireland is still going, Roman Catholic, Presbyterian, and by the beginning of the 19th century, you also have a very strong Methodist presence in Northern Ireland, as well as a, a Quaker presence. And it's interesting, Ireland started civil registration of everything but Catholic marriages in 1845. But then they didn't start doing civil registration, what we would consider going to the town hall to get a marriage license or register a birth. For Catholic marriages or for births and deaths of anybody until 1864. And trust me, I have muttered about this frequently because I have a Scots-Irish ancestor who was probably born in 1846 in County Tyrone. And I have no record of him before his marriage in Scotland. 25 years later. Although I have found his brother's baptismal record. So as I said, the, the Church of Ireland records may contain non-Church of Ireland members because they were the official records. So oops. So if you're looking, you want to look there. Um, they're in Dublin. Many of them have been digitized. They'll be in the handout. Um, and with all of these for Ireland, you get some that are still in local hands because somebody didn't send them in. The Presbyterians have never really asked for them from their member churches. Um, so that's why you're not going to find, they'll be in local, they'll still be with the congregation. They'll be at a local county archive, something like that. Um, Others of these will be at the Public Records Office of Northern Ireland, which is often called Prony. They have a wonderful website. Um, if you just Google Prony Ireland, it'll come up. It's also going to be in the handout. Um, the Catholic records are online now, but they're not indexed well. Um, and some of those, again, are kept. Crony Summit, the National Library of Ireland in Dublin. And that's a lot of the issue with, with Scots-Irish genealogy is figuring out where things are 
both in terms of where the record was generated and then where it ended up after the 1922 separation between the Republic of Ireland and um, Northern Ireland. And you know, there are early baptism records um, and they're pretty basic. Um, by the 1860s, you're getting civil registration, which has nice fill in the blanks. And um, you will get, and this is a marriage, you get the bride and groom. It says full age, meaning they're 21 or older. Sometimes this will just say 21 instead of full age. So if you're looking at one of these and it says 21, don't assume that that's, it may mean 21 or older. Um, and you get the, the town land and the parish, um, the father's name and the father's profession. And let me tell you, this is very helpful because the Irish were about as creative as my Scottish ancestors with names. In other words, they were not creative at all. Um, the later census schedules um, that are that survived for 1901 and 1911, they're online for free at the National Library of Scotland. They're, again, I'll put it in the handout that I'll put in the chat when I'm done talking. And as I said, they classify the um, quality of house which I always thought was interesting. Um, there are 19th century census substitutes. Um, I love the fact that Find My Past has 7.3 million records that are actually listings of people buying a dog license in the 1800s in Ireland. But when you're missing censuses, genealogists will take what they can get. And I can tell you that my couple greats grandfather owned a Cocker Spaniel named Bertha <laughs> and paid a tax on it for her. Um, the other thing that's interesting here, these old age pension eligibility, Ireland started an old age pension just before World War I. And since many people you know, were born before 1864 in civil registration, one way they could prove that they were old enough for the pension was to get a copy of the 1841 or 1851 census listing them. And so there are these huge books. They're like two and a half feet by 18 inches by seven or eight inches deep. And they're at Crony, the public records office of, of Northern Ireland. And they've been digitized now, and you can look through them to see if, you know, if your ancestor was a famine immigrant, maybe a sibling was still in Ireland looking for a pension. Griffiths, oh, sorry, tie the plotment books. This is the last gasp of the Church of Ireland. They're in the 1820s and 30s. They still get tax money because they're the official state church. And so this is going through and figuring out, again, you've got the class of the house, first, second, third, and fourth, how many acres they had and how much they owed. Not everybody's in this. This misses a lot of people in the upper middle and upper class and the absolutely destitute. Griffith's valuation, again, tax records, money. Money generates records. And so you'll get, and these are interesting because they're right around the time of the famine. They start in 1846 and the published ones go through the 1860s. And again, you have um, who occupies the building, who's leasing, who they're leasing it from, land, house and land, sometimes the office, barn, shop, how many acres it is and what the tax valuation is. And there's now a website that is in the um, handout I'm gonna give you, um, this one, where you can put in a town land and it will show you everybody who lived there and um, link to a map from the 1850s. 
that has an overlay where you can do a slider bar with the modern Google map. It's, it's, I could do an entire program on it. It's just, I geek out on it. This is a little town in Senegal, right by the um, border near Dairy, London Dairy. Um, and as you can see, you get things with, you get, this is the town name in English. This is in Irish Gaelic. Um, you can see this town may have 300 people and there are two different churches. Actually, there are three churches. I forgot what the third one is. But there's a Church of Ireland, a Catholic church, and a Presbyterian church, and a town of three or 400 people. And you can see the map here. It is not a big town. Um, but some of my ancestors lived there, so I thought I'd give you a feel for what it looked like. This is probably at the high end. This would have probably, from what I understand, be classified as a, a grade three building from that first through fourth class. Oops. Oh, here's this site where you can put in a name and it brings up the map. It's, it's absolutely wonderful. I mentioned the poor law records. This is a poor house in um, County Roscommon, if I remember correctly. You can see the people on the left. If you lived in the poor house, you had to give up all your possessions. You wore a uniform. Um, it was not meant to be a pleasant life. You got just enough to keep you from dying of starvation. And I said, as I said, here's um, a dog license register. This is my couple great uncle, John Arthur, lived in Lifford, which is right across the um, Itton Scribane. Our, one is in Northern Ireland, one's in the Republic of Ireland. And let me tell you, the people there have no desire to have a hard border back with Brexit. And you can see he paid tax. It's a black dog. It's a water spaniel named Jess. So this at least tells you where people are and um, gives you an idea of, of the names in the area and so on. So there are other records, um, police records. As I said, the great estate papers are wonderful. You do get um, wills and probate indexes from this era, but the actual wills did burn in the Four Courts 1922 fire. And deeds aren't, you know, I use deeds all the time here in New England. Very few people in um, Ireland would have been involved with deeds. Okay, names in Ireland. Your Irish ancestors used very few names. I can guarantee you, um, especially before about 1860. Some name, many names are very localized. Um, and if, that's one of the reasons I wanted to put this in, because even if you, I'm gonna show you how someone, how you may be able to use the fact that they're localized to figure out where in Ireland your ancestors are from. And one thing I noticed um, that I had seen anywhere. Um, when I was in Ireland doing research, I went into, I did a consultation with the genealogist at the um, National Archives of Ireland. And she told me very emphatically, because I'm looking for a couple of great grandfather, who's always in the records is Edward James Arthur. And she insisted that somebody born in that era would not have a middle name. He must have added it later. But I noticed as I was looking through records, and I had ancestors in Ireland in the 1820s to 40s who were Catholic. I had ancestors who were Church of Ireland and ancestors who were Presbyterian. That by the 1830s, the Presbyterians are giving their kids a middle name. The other two groups weren't, but about 90% of the people I saw with middle names in that era were Presbyterian. So just an interesting little, I, I keep wanting to go back and do more research, but I haven't had a chance. So names, there are several websites that do surname um, distribution maps. And so this is one of them and you can see the bigger the circle, the more the name occurs there. And so this is for the surname Arthur. 
which is, as you saw, John Arthur, um, who I'm looking, I'm looking for his brother, Edward James. And you can see there's a big circle here and there's none down here. And they do, they use different things for this. They, um, they use census records, they use birth records, all sorts of things like that. Again, here's Arthur, and you can see these are two different ways of doing it. And again, you have big circles, you know, some density here, a little down here, and huge parts of the country with nobody. And again, by 1901, this is kind of late, but it does give you some idea where you're going to find people with that name. Here's, and this is my favorite one. Um, and they thought, as you can see, this is, they include the variations and I didn't clip it, but they do list the variations on the page. And again, you can see it's pretty clear. There's a pretty good chance if your name, if I'm looking for somebody named, whose last name is Arthur, they're going to be from Northern Ireland and not from down south. And this is my Arthur married a hood. And as you can see, again, there's a nice overlap in the distribution. And so this is one of the things you can do if you know two people were married in Ireland, you can go to this the website, put in both and hope they overlap. Now, if it was this for one name and down here for another, you might want to think, well, maybe they met in Dublin as they were leaving or, or Galway. But in this case, I'm pretty sure that they would have interacted in their everyday life. And here's just showing those two. So you can see there is a fair bit of overlap there. And that town I showed you is right at the end of that era, arrow and it's one of the towns where the family did indeed live. Um, this is Gallagher. Um, this is a native Irish name and you can see it's in an area, as I said, way back at the beginning of this, the, the Scots-Irish only settled in the eastern part of Donegal and not the western. And so this is looking at the county level and Gallagher is actually concentrated on the, the west coast and down here in the, in the city of Donegal. But remember this in a minute because I'm going to come back to this. And here's this distribution for Blaney, another good Irish name. Um, and this would have been Irish Catholic, but I wanted to show you this for a reason because I have something coming up. And just to show you, even such a dis indisputably Irish name as Murphy has differences in concentration. You can see there's not much in what's Northern Ireland, not much here in the central part, but there is some around Cork and around Waterford and then out this way, but not here, you know, in this sort of T-shaped central area. So even, you know, even with fairly common names, it's worth doing just to see if something pops out. Um, I know McGuire is centered right in this area, just below where Northern Ireland is. The, the McGuire's were in this area here. And so that, that can help you figure out um, what, where you might want to start looking. Finally, and you know, I've never been accused of being short-winded, so <laughs> I'm doing my best. Um, can DNA help? Yes. Um, there are two ways. One is if you've got a straight paternal line, your father's 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 father, who um, is one of your Irish lines, it is worth having Y-DNA done. Only males, any female in the line will break the chain. Um, autosomal DNA is what most people have done. It goes back generally five to seven generations and so you're getting into the early 19th century. And what at least it's doing there is it's letting you, in some cases, put together um, ancestors who immigrated to the US in the 1700s to different places and maybe connecting to 
um, a line that stayed in Ireland. Um, I've actually been able to make some progress on, oops, um, my Arthurs, confirming that a John Arthur that I was looking at was the right John Arthur because of a DNA match. That John Arthur with the dog Jess is the right one because his granddaughter is in a tree that I match with as a third cousin so or fourth cousin. So that does help. So let's take a look. This is my, my father is the one here, Charles Jameson. So here's a line of men. And my great grandfather was adopted. He was born Peter McGee. And um, McGee is one of those interesting names because it can be either native Irish Catholic or Scots-Irish Presbyterian. And I was pretty sure from records that my McGee's were indeed native Irish, but it was interesting to confirm looking at my closest matches, not only McGee's, but Gallagher's, Blaney's, Fahey's, Donahue's, and McCann's. And so I'm able to look at this and look at the surname distribution map, they overlap on all of these. That's why I showed you the Gallagher and Blaney. And all of my closest matches, like through the first 50, have names like this that are obviously Irish Catholic. But I could have just as easily had McGee's that were matching with you know, Kennedys and, and Armstrongs and such who were Scots Irish. So this, this just confirmed for me that I am in the right ballpark on this. Oops. So again, they do have some overlap and it, my ancestors are from this part right here. Um, and there is distinct DNA differences. Um, there are some, a couple of the um, DNA companies are beginning to be able to do some pinpointing where in inside the UK people come from. Um, Orkney has a very distinct signature, um, as does as do parts of Ireland. As you can see, Dublin, Central Ireland, and Ulster, and North and South Munster down here in the south actually have you can see there's a fairly distinct line. You can barely see the green, but you can see the blue, and there's a fairly distinct line there. And so, you know, this has lots of issues. I'd have to come back and do a DNA program for you to understand why this isn't going to just tell you where your ancestors were from, but there are some clues and, and the testing is getting better. Um, but you can see here, this blue overlaps with this blue in Scotland. And that's exactly what you'd expect is for this area to basically be genetically the same because of the migration back and forth. Because many of the Scots who, and I didn't get into this because I was trying to simplify it to get it into, and I know, I'm sorry, I didn't make it in an hour. Um, the Scots who migrated here to become Scots Irish were actually you know, descendants over six to a thousand, 600 to 1,000 years of people who'd immigrated from here over here. So this is basically one genetic pool. So, I'm going to stop sharing at this point and turn my video back on. And then I will put the file in so you can all have it once I find it. But I'm now happy to take whatever questions people have. Yeah, don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay, that should be in there. I'm also going to put my work email in here. 
Let me make sure I've typed this correctly. Yeah. Um, so if you think of a question tomorrow, feel free to email me. I will tell you, I usually run two days to a week behind on answering emails. I apologize to everyone in advance, but that's just how life goes. Um, BJ, I've got a quick question. Um, on one of those earlier slides, you were talking about, um, let me show who I am. Uh, one of the earlier slides you were talking about uh, that a particular area in County Down that was privately, what was it, privately settled or it was privately something. Uh, yeah, it was private investors essentially. Right, and so can you tell me a little bit more about what that means? Basically, it was rich people from England uh -huh. who, in you know, it's not, I know less about that than about the Scott settlement, but it was um, private investors who teamed up with some of the big London craft artisan guilds. And because they were doing the same kind of um, settling to, pe to Protestantize the, the area, you know, it, it was a way, you know how Pennsylvania came about partly because it was a, an easy way for the king to give William Penn what he was owed. Okay. But, you know, because his father had, Penn's father had lent the king money. It's kind of the same sort of thing as the, the English government was able to say, yet, you know, we're taking this land from the Catholic landowners and we're giving it to you to turn around and develop. Okay, because it, what, the area in County Down where my ancestry came from, it was marked with that color. So I said, oh, this is something yeah. I was unaware of. Yeah, and there, there's some, I'll, I'll try to remember to send you a link about more of it. I've got one, okay. Wayne, and if I don't, pester me. You know, you, you've pester, been through pester, this. Pester, pester. Um, you know, and, and those were big chunks. There was, even within those colors, there is um, places where, you know, it, there would have been patchwork and you would have had maybe a Scottish landowner have some or whatever. Um, and many of the English landowners did bring people from Scotland mm -hmm. or from the borders. Um, well, I know in the area where my ancestry came from, the name Hamilton was constantly referred to, that there was this somebody named Hamilton who must have been a bigwig. Yeah, there's a joke of Hamilton and Brandon, I think. I don't remember. Off the top of my head, I am I used to be able to name all of the, the, believe it or not, I used to be able to uh, name it, but all of the, the Dukes and I can't anymore. Why does that not surprise me? <laughs> Um, well, actually, what's funny is I have, I'm looking, I actually have a, I'm, I've been working my way through on a, one of my personal projects uh -huh. because I actually, I go home and do my own genealogy after spending the day helping everybody else. <laughs> um, and so I, I just, I have to show this because it's funny. Uh -huh. um, I've been working on going through Edinburgh almanacs and directories to find all of the early 18th century Jamesons. Uh -huh. And look what I actually have up on my screen on my personal tab, at my personal research tab at the moment. And it's a list of the House of Peers as of 1847. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when you asked that question, I was like, but you know, many of these. Um, I know some of these had huge estates in um, in Ireland, um, and so although Sutherland is the one who cleared the Highlands of Scotland, um, so anyhow, interesting. 
I'm, is... I'm a complete geek. I fully admit it. <laughs> um, yeah, if, if you want more of what, what I've done, if you go to YouTube and just type in genealogy Maine State Library, it'll come up as a choice. Yeah, I hate playing on camera. <laughs> and so I think it's just absolutely amazing that I have my own YouTube channel. It's just, <laughs> I have some friends who I think can't quite believe it. Yeah, uh, BJ is, oh, there's a cat's tail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, is the uh, handout going to be in the uh, YouTube channel? Uh, someone's I'll put a link to it there and I'll put it up. I also okay. have a very badly maintained blog called Mainly Genealogy, spelled like the... I'll put it in the... It's one of the things that the library move has put on hold. Um, I will put the handout up there as well. Okay, great. Or you can email me. Um, And I will email it to you as well, Catherine. Okay, great. And that way, if, if somebody wants to get it from you. That or, or I can have Alana, um, you don't mind if we just kind of post it to, to our website? No, that's fine. I, okay. I'm i of the opinion, you know, I'm paid by the state. So I don't really feel personally possessive about what I generate. Okay. But I just like to ask just in case. Yeah, no. It's, okay, it's great. great. I'll help her do that. So... PJ, um, did you ever find Scout? Yeah, that was who was here. That he, was good, good. I feel better now. Thank you. Yeah. No, I, it took a try. My cats got out earlier this summer. They barged through a screen, which they've never, it's a long story they've never done before. And um, Hobbs was sensible and came back to the front door that the night they got out. Scout, I had to borrow a trap and it was not fun. So, yeah, I'm glad he's back. I had a question that I posted. Oops. Oh, Debbie, let's see. Do I see it? I had a question that I posted about what about the connections to folks from Scandinavia coming over to Scotland or Ireland? Yeah, that was much earlier, um, but it, it is still part of the genetic mix, and it certainly survives in. Um, Some of some areas more than others. Um, that's, for example, one reason Orkney and Shetland have a distinct genetic signature. That's where my family went to was the Orkney. Yes. Yeah. Is there a special place where I could find some more information without going through the DNA searching? Yeah, there's an article. Let me find it. Hang on. I, I had it up earlier today and I can see it because that would be too easy. If you have the most menopausal osteoporosis, you have this Okay, let me see if I can find this for you. Thanks. Oh, no, that's just the... Anyhow, any other questions while I look for this? I don't want you to waste time tonight on, on that. If you yeah. can send me the link by email, you've got my email address. That would be probably. Sweet. Yeah. Okay. Can I jump in or? Yeah. Can I ask, I'm Cynthia, and I, I know that um, my forebear, Robert Ross, who was born in 1709, left from Northern Ireland and went to Pennsylvania, Fayette County, Pennsylvania. But I don't know when. <laughs> he married uh, in Northern Ireland, uh, uh, Jane Lotta. She was born in Northern Ireland. They had a daughter in Northern Ireland who was born, I don't know exactly when, but um, 
We think it was like it's 1745 that he came to Pennsylvania. And I'm trying, we never, we never knew exactly why <laughs> or where, and where, is there any place I could get information on that, do you think? Well, in, in that era, most of the immigration, if he was Protestant, would have been economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, I think um, if you haven't looked to see if he's in land records, I would start there. Um, many of the Pennsylvania land records are online at Family Search. Many of them are not indexed. You have to use the catalog um, and search by the place. Um, and you have to make sure you're paying attention to county boundary changes because a lot of counties that are, it's now Fayette County, but in 17, whatever, it may have been something else. Um, it's not unusual for the first deed to mention that if he bought land, it, the first deed to mention, it would not be unusual for the first deed to mention where he had come from in Ireland. Because they will say so and so of such and such a place in Ireland. Um, and there's a distinct tendency I've just noticed with Scots, Scots Irish, Irish, and German immigrants, they, if they are managed to buy land, they not only do they buy land, they tend to be very good about getting it recorded. I think because as immigrants, they were coming from places where they would have never expected to own land, and they wanted to make sure they could prove it. Oh, so, um. My first port of call basically on pre-1820 immigrants, when you start getting some level of passenger lists is to, um, is to check the land records um, because that's going to be, if they, if they had enough money to buy land, they were going to buy it and record it. They were gonna buy it I'm sorry, I didn't get to the last part. And, 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 and recorded at the county courthouse that they bought it so that they could prove it was theirs. Um, okay. So the other thing is to look, and again, it's, it's partly looking at family search by place, and it may be contacting the local historical or genealogical society to see what church records there are. Because if they were, Presbyterian or Catholic, there's often a record of the transfer of their membership. <clears throat> I don't know that Anglican churches kept those, but a lot of Presbyterian churches will have kept it because many of them at that point did what was called closed communion and only people really in, in, in commun, you know, in you, you know, like-minded people could take communion. And so they wanted proof that this new person was eligible. So, and, and many of the assisted emigration um, programs from Ireland and Scotland, if they were organized by the landowner, the, the, the local minister or priest would have basically gone through and given everybody a, a a letter of transfer. If the if the minister didn't come with them, there were cases where the minister just came with them. <laughs> it said um, they apparently immigrated to Northern Ireland sometime before 1709. Yeah. And um, that and they were from Ross County, Belnagown Mountains in Northern Scotland. By religion, they were Covenanters. Yeah, so they would have been firm Presbyterians. So yeah, you're you're going to want to look for church records and land records. Those are going to be your your best bets at that time period in Pennsylvania. Uh, is there someone that I can um, go to and hire that would help <laughs> help me? Yeah. Um. Why don't Why don't you email me? Yes, I will. And I will put you in touch with 
places to look and for what, people to hire. What is your email? So it's B. Uh huh. Dot J. E. Dot J. Dot J A M I E S O N. Yes. At Maine, like the state. Uh huh. Dot gov. Thank you. Okay, great. That's wonderful. Great. Yeah, I will do that. Because <laughs> yeah. uh, our whole there's a, a bunch of my family would like to know, you know, exactly why they left and where they Yeah, and you may end up having to do some of this, you know, looking to see where names are you know, looking where his okay. name and his wife's name are and mm -hmm. see if they overlap and things like that. But I'll, I'll work with you to get you to the point where you can try some of that. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> no problem. Great. What I'm here for. Oh, thanks. I'll turn off here. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Leonard here. Hi, Leonard. My earliest Irish ancestor came from Ulster in the 1700s as uh, part of the British Army and he served under Burgoyne. Mm -hmm. Is there a place where I might check British records? Yes. The National Archives, um, let me find the link and I'll put it in the chat. It's the National Archives of England. Uh oh, let me find. National Archives. It is their website is one of my all time favorite websites. Um, I'm going to put this in the chat, and then I'm going to bring up. I'm going to share my screen for a minute so I can show you. Um. This is what it looks like. Um, if you go into search the catalog, and they have not only what they have, but more than 2,500 archives in the UK have their um, online catalogs um, tied into this. And so if, if you, AJ, can you make your screen larger so we can copy the address? Oh, I put it in the in the chat. It's nationalarchive.gov.uk. Thank you. And so, as you can see, I clicked away the tour because I didn't need it. Click away, accept cookies, and I'm getting thirty nine hundred results. But what you can do then is go over here and choose 1700 to 1799 and hit refine. And we're down to 675. And then what I'm going to do next, you'll see like this is from Bedfordshire. And so I'm going to hit just National Archives because to start with, that's where you're going to find most of the military records. And then you'll notice over here, you have categories and you'll wanna start with WO, the War Office, although you may eventually wanna get into some of these others. Um, what I'm planning to do a program for the State Library genealogy club at some point fairly soon on searching this because I've worked with several people on it. And so I figure it's at this point, rather I, it's gonna be easier to just do a program that I can give people the link to um, and they can watch it at their leisure. And you know, some of these won't um, be, but if we go into the war office ones, um, and you can see here something against general. And what you would then want to do is figure out what, you know, there'll be muscle rolls, other things like that. You'll be able to figure out 
the name of the um, regiment your ancestor was in, and then you can search that. It's worth searching his name because sometimes you will find things like here's a letter from Mrs. Mary Wade, um, a letter from a close friend named Edward Mason, and so on. The other place to look, and let me find this. And again, I don't have the time to um, spend a lot of time on this with this. But this wonderful website called Archive Grid is basically an attempt to do for archives what WorldCat, the World Catalog does for library catalogs. And it's trying to um, be a union catalog for all the various little archives. So you can see here, these are just a recent edition. So you get things as big as Stanford University's manuscript collection, and you get you know, tiny little, you know, the Dominican Sisters of San Rafael archives. And, um, you know, all of sorts of things here. Um, I, I set a timer when I come to look at something here because it's way too easy to say, oh, maybe I'll look for that. Or, oh, I was wondering about this the other day. Um, so I would do nationalarchives.gov.uk and I would check here to see you know, if there are papers from someone who stayed you know, here. Um, those are my two. Yet TNA Discovery will get you to the, the, the National Archives catalog. Okay. How about, have you had experience going to the Imperial War Museum? They have some, I've, you, I've, I've mostly had questions for them where I actually was emailing because it wasn't on their site, but I was pretty sure it was in their collection. They have an amazing collection. Um, and I don't know with current events how they're, responses, but I know that they have archivists who know what they've got and can do a really good job helping you figure out what you want. Thank you. Okay, anything else? And as I said, I'm more than happy to answer emails. I'll tell you right now, email is better than a phone call. <laughs> I'm not at my desk a lot of the time, so email is, is good. Um, and Scout says, thank you for coming to hear the human talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, this has been fascinating. I've learned a lot, and I might be contacting BJ myself to find my great-great-great-grandfather somewhere in Ireland or so. So thank you everyone for coming and um, enjoy the rest of your evening.